Last night at about 2 a.m., my dog started barking viciously. I have a German Shepherd. She's my guard dog, so I'm no stranger to aggressive barks. But this was the most intense behavior I had ever seen from her before. Again, I have really never heard her behave like that. I thought about getting a weapon. I was really scared that someone might be at the door, but then I remembered that my cat was outside, so maybe it was just my cat making a fuss. Even if it was an intruder, my dog would kill someone to protect me. I looked through our peephole, but no one was there, so I opened the door. My dog had been barking the whole time. When I opened the door, instead of going out to sniff around like she usually does, she planted herself in front of me and got even louder. She was guarding me. I have never seen anything like that from her. I looked out to see what it could be, and then I saw it. The first thing I noticed were the eyes. It was sort of like when you shine a light on animal eyes, sort of glowing in the nighttime darkness. I then noticed the antlers and thought it must be a deer. But then I realized its face looked about nine feet above the ground. Then I noticed its body. I could make out the outline and tell that it was fur, but it was standing in a human-like position, hunched over almost, on its hind legs. I have never been so terrified. As soon as I realized I was looking at something paranormal, I slammed all of the doors, shut all of my windows, locked all of the doors, and hid under the sheets like I was a little kid. I'm still shaken up. I can't stop thinking about it. I haven't fallen asleep tonight because every time I close my eyes, I see it. I'm curious what this creature was. I know the appearance of a Wendigo is debated and seems to be controversial, but I am still terrified by what I saw. I live in rural North Carolina with lots of woods, decently spaced out farmland, and lots of critters. I'm also a little more in tune to supernatural things than some people. Like my eyes well up with tears, and I get a spine-rolling chill if something that isn't human is around me. Last night, around 1.40ish in the morning, I'm on a call with my boyfriend, with my bedroom light on. My bedroom has a large window facing the road, and, from around the corner of my eye, I see a blur of white dart back and forth twice. Immediately, I get a churn in my stomach, my eyes well up, and I get a shiver down my spine. Normally, I don't hone in on this, because I don't like to mess with spirits. My house has a few, and while I know I live here now, I also know it was once their house, and I want to be respectful to them, and the place they live and died in. However, I completely freak out at this, turn my light off, slip under my blankets, and watch the window. The shivering is gone, for now, but there's a deep gut feeling of unease. My cat got up from where she was napping by the window and left my room in a hurry. Wouldn't even let me touch her, which is odd for her, because she's hyper-affectionate like a dog. And even as I'm writing this, she's in my lap purring up a storm. So, that in itself was scary. However, my boyfriend has had experiences with supernatural creatures and entities. So I'm talking to him about it, and he's trying to help me understand it. When describing its appearance, I tell him that the creature is tall, and then go on to, and so pale. To which he said, pale like me, or pale pale? And I responded, pale pale pale. The conversation keeps going, and my partner brings up skinwalkers and wendigos. I'm not claiming that this was either of those things. I simply don't know enough. Fast forward, my boyfriend asks out of the blue what his birthday is. And I responded with his birthday, asking why he would ask that. He said, Asking for personal information is a good way to see if someone has been taken. And at the word taken, my whole body thrums, 
like I grabbed the cord of a guitar, pulled, and released. Later on, after I left my bedroom, locked my doors, checked that my cats are inside, and have rung a bell a few times, as a friend who is experienced in supernatural encounters tells me to do, I sit down, and I begin to research. It's about 2.30, and I typed in Windigo into Google. I receive no shiver, and get the information. I then type in Skinwalker, and the full body thrum is back, so I cleared my Google search bar and exited that square, and nothing happens after that. It was Rural Hill County, Texas, 2005. We had a couple acres of land with the majority of the property, pretty much all but the house, the second house, the shed and the driveway, being completely surrounded by trees. I was five at the time and got in the back of our family car, getting ready to go to the store. My dad was walking from the shed, getting ready to take me and my brother who was six. We peek out of the back window, looking back at our dad, as we see from the right side of the forest, a large, skinny, white, solid creature with long arms and legs run out, bipedal. It ran just past our dad. I was young at the time, so bear with me, but it couldn't have been more than 50 feet away. We watched it run all the way past him, directly to our shed, where it jumped on all fours and crawled under. The shed was propped up on concrete bricks, probably about eight inches. My brother and I returned looks to each other, and we just started crying. Almost 20 years later, and my brother and I can still describe in full detail to each other how it was relative to the house and the shed and other things. My mother tells me she believes me now, she said creepy stuff happened there all the time. That moment gave me a fear of the outside for a long time. However, if I could, I would like to see it again, just to know what it is. Let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life, ever, for one second, believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother, who has always sensed presences and has been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. Until last night, which is safe to say, marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We always have the same place we like to go when we camp with minimum effort, and our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. And when I asked him what was wrong, he shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving around 12 or 1 a.m. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which, in Middle Eastern culture, is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed at that time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then, he spilt an entire bottle of coke on his phone. Then, he dropped it into the sand and then proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on, which is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp press right against his arm, and he realized it was an unsheathed knife. He packed it with its case the previous night, and he later said it felt like something pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively, within a matter of a few hours, 
was certainly making both of us uneasy. And I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Ultima, so we didn't expect to encounter so many issues that we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, they got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in the sand, and the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip. And later, my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he started feeling an evil presence around us, but he didn't want to say anything as to not ruin the trip and freak me out. So we ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which, again, was far harder than it had to be. First, our tow strap broke off their bumper. Tow straps cost about $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves, and a 20-minute job took more like 90. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark quickly, so we scrambled to build a fire to cook our dinner before we were asked to help the couple. And I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. However, my brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat, and said, with clear fear in his voice, that we should do so as quickly as possible, and that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We're Christian, so of course we thought it would help. But I think it accelerated everything that happened, and just made whatever was there with us angry. We finished our dinner, and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine and pretty much just humoring my brother, until I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave, and I was quite taken aback by the feeling, so I voiced it to my brother and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, and that's when we heard a sound very close to us on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big. Something that I could only describe as the sound of death itself, and it seemed to go on for several minutes. When I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean I was ready to have a heart attack right there and then. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car, drove it back so we could see with better light, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. Sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us, then the shadows from behind the trees. I tried to get the shadows to change shape, walking around the trees and moving the lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. And you could really feel it, too. We felt like we weren't alone, and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees, so they weren't the ones snapping the twigs. I felt like whatever was there was getting closer, and I have never felt anything like it, it was a gut feeling, and you just know it's one of those natural instincts that you shouldn't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly, but it was still very silent, and at this point, it was around 8pm, and it was unusual for that. 
I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving away back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand, and I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off and completely fighting against me. The sound of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sounds of the car. And on the path was what seemed to be like every bird in the area, just standing there and staring at us, until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me, and under no circumstance to look through the window. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota Hilux, positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees, but was far enough from our campsite to be easily ruled out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw was as we were getting close to the exit. We saw standing in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. I've only ever seen one deer in the 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock, and the deer wasn't moving at all, until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer, and again my brother, with a grasp and then very sternly said, to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him when we got on the highway what it was that he kept seeing, and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend and they were all pointing either right at us or ahead of us. We were still yet to encounter anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. When I saw the exit, I was happy as I ever have been, but that quickly faded when once again we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. Except this time, it didn't really look like a deer, more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer. And its eyes were milky, and it looked rotten and horrible. But I didn't much care, I just stepped on the gas, and fortunately, it had gotten out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, and then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with the same tone of voice, said to go to the town and to go left. Later, he once again said that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us. So if we would have gone that way, we wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And, of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us and most likely cause us harm. He also said that they caused bad luck and that he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. This is also my younger brother by three years, and naturally any time he ever told me about this sort of thing, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw that night. I can excuse the gut feeling of just being scared. But I cannot excuse the two deers we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out, as did the tone of my brother's voice, and it's safe to say 
We're not going camping there again. I'm never dismissing my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again, and I am so thankful that we made it home safely. Two weeks ago, me and a group of buddies were having a bonfire out in Kuna, Idaho. I was feeling down that night, so I decided to unload my dirt bike and take a little night ride on some trails. I went alone and rode for probably three miles from the fire up to the hill. I sat up there for probably 45 minutes, and I was 100% alone up there. There was nobody around. From time to time, I would start hearing small laughter really close by. It sounded like two to three people. It wasn't constant. I would hear it every five minutes, and it kept getting closer. I had that funny feeling that I wasn't alone after all. So I went to start my bike, and of course it doesn't start. I was able to bump start it going down the hill and it did not want to stay running. I don't think it sat long enough for the engine temperature to drop all the way back down. I had to keep revving it to keep it running to head back to the fire. The whole time I was really scared for no reason. I couldn't convince myself to go faster than five miles per hour, which was strange because I always haul ass. I have a light bar mounted on my bike, so I was able to see just fine. At first, riding back, I thought I saw shadowy figures in the corner of my eyes, but they would just disappear. I made it back safe and nothing else happened, but I knew there was something out there that night. I didn't think much of it until I heard my buddies talking about skinwalker stories in the same area. People tell me I got extremely lucky that night. I don't know what to believe. Who knows what was out there with me that night? The laughter, my bike not wanting to run, the feeling I had, and the shadow figures are all things in common I saw from other stories. It was a strange night. This happened in North Las Vegas, Nevada. This is something that I experienced about four or five years ago. I had some friends over from out of town. We were talking about the paranormal experiences we've had in the past. During the conversation, we experienced a few odd things. At first, it was just a lot of loud walking upstairs. We were home alone, and it wasn't any of us. That part wasn't very weird to me. My family and I already believed the spirit of the previous owner was still in the house. We had a lot of experiences with her and a neighbor had told us that she had died in the garage of our house. But, as we continued with our stories, one of my friends saw what looked like a large black bird flying up my staircase. When we checked, we didn't see anything there, but since we all had our own experiences and reasons to believe in the paranormal, we decided that it was a sign to stop and change the subject. After that, things settled down, and my friends left the next day and went home. A few days after my friends had left, I woke up in the middle of the night, I think it was sometime after midnight, and as I would normally do, I went downstairs and got some water from the garage. When I grabbed the water from the pack, I looked up, and very close to me, I saw a figure standing there. It was very clear. It stood about seven or eight feet tall. Its arms, legs, and torso looked like a very muscular man, and its head looked massive, like a wolf. Its skin and fur was black, like charcoal. As soon as I saw it, I bolted back into my house, locked the garage, and went straight to my room. The energy coming off of it was utterly terrifying, it's the only paranormal experience that I've had that I actually felt like I was in real danger. I did move from that house years ago, but still to this day, I have yet to have anyone be able to give me a solid ID on what I saw. 
Personally, I think it was either a demon or a skinwalker. I know there was a Native American reservation not far from the house. Additionally, just outside the neighborhood, there was a decent-sized plot of empty land that was owned by the Air Force. And my family and I had seen two massive coyotes, bigger than anyone in my family had ever seen, wandering the neighborhood. It was late, around 12 to 2 a.m., sometime around then. I was dropping off my girlfriend at the time back to her house. It was raining kind of hard, but then stopped by the time I reached my house, after I dropped her off. There's this Korean church across the road near my house, which is dimly lit. I'm looking at the church to get my keys to unlock the door, and there's a person at least six feet tall, staring at me from the church in the dimly lit area. Which I should add, the light was illuminating this cross that was underneath the light. Anything underneath this light you can see 100%. It was only dim for me because I'm at least 100 feet away, and it was a very orangish old light. The figure that was standing in the spotlight that the light was giving was still pure black. My heart begins to start beating quicker, because I start thinking to myself that this isn't right, because it wasn't. I'm still struggling to get the keys into the lock, because I keep looking over and focusing on the figure. I finally have the keys in the door, and I'm unlocking it to go inside. As I turn to see the thing one last time, it was now running towards me. Its arms were above its head, and it was waving them, but they were super wiggly. I don't even know how to explain it. It's as if you were to strum a guitar string and the string waves and wiggles. Its arms were doing exactly that. It's about 40 to 50 feet away from me at this point, and I still can't see any facial expressions or anything. It's darker than the night sky. I hurry up to go inside and I lock the door, scared to look out the window. It's the next day and I'm still shocked and scared. I've never seen it since then. I started calling it the Wiggler ever since. It just kind of suits it. When we were young, my cousins and I had a bush house at the end of the back garden just before the garden opened up on the heath. Due to me being a full-time wheelchair user from birth, it was Grand's idea that instead of having a treehouse that had to be climbed, it would be safer and more practical to have a bush house that all of us kids could use. Even though we protested greatly, although I am disabled, I frequently used to climb trees in my local parks and over the heath, with the help of my cousins, obviously. But Grand's word was final, and we never argued with her, as she was a beautiful and lovely matriarch but also as tough as old boots, and very scary when pushed. So we busied ourselves on choosing an appropriate bush for our new play area. On selecting a perfect one, Grand delegated tasks to the older boys to clear the outer area of the bush, and also make a little hollow inside it, with pieces of spare wood on the ground to serve as a basic floor so that my little wheelchair could run safely and easily inside it. Gran was reasonably young at the time, and while the boys were doing the heavy work, she arranged us younger ones in getting furniture, supplies, and accessories to make our new play space cozy and comfortable for us all. A year later, and our bush house was in full use. In the daytime, us younger ones played in it after school, on weekends and holidays, and in the evenings and nights, it was a place where the older cousins could have some privacy, away from the eyes of Gran and Mom to do whatever they did. Our bush house was cozy, though. We got chairs, bean bags, and floor cushions, donated by relatives and friends of the family. We also had a small table that we made a tablecloth for, and our Auntie Jay made some pretty curtains that we hung up the best that we could. We even had a cupboard where we kept snacks in, and 
only when older boys or mom were there, we were allowed to use the camping stove to heat tinned beans and sausages or pot noodles up and make tea. Gran's bingo friend Jean donated a hand-me-down rug. It was shabby and out of date, but we thought it was beautiful. It was slap bang in the middle of summer holidays, probably in early July, when this happened. L and I were seven, and G was eleven. Our older cousin G's brother, A, was there earlier, but by three o'clock, he had grown tired of hanging around us and had gone out with his mates. The three of them were coming back later to make us all dinner on the stove. L and I were sitting at the table, playing beggar your neighbor, with a pack of playing cards that we got from the living room cupboard. And G was sitting in the corner of the bush house on the beanbag, reading the secret garden. It was just a normal day at home. Nothing unusual or odd occurred, until around four, when we all heard a sound that was at odds with the peaceful scene. It was between a growl and an owl's hoot and a man mumbling. We weren't particularly outdoorsy kids, being born and raised in the outskirts of urban London. But being bright little girls, we all knew that owls are nocturnal creatures, and the accompanying sounds that were mixed with the hoots didn't come from the same bird. The weird sounds were joined by a furtive and stealthy rustling coming from the back of the bush house. Actually, it was really near to where G was sitting, and she jumped up, stifling a scream by covering her mouth with her hands. We also saw a dark, dog-like size and shape through the dense foliage of the back of the bush house, which incidentally led straight onto the beginning of the heath, as I said earlier. The strangest thing about this figure was that it was very present and rather ethereal, almost as if the figure was attempting to hide intentionally. Also, throughout this period, there were no other natural sounds, no birdsong, no insect sounds, and no background human noise. Being right in the center of a council estate, you could always hear people talking, cars revving, and dogs barking, all the regular noises of urban community living. But at the time, it was as if the entire world had paused, and us three were the only conscious and present ones, along with the mysterious figure. We didn't know what to do, but we gathered together, and both G and L took one handle of my wheelchair and pulled me back out of our bush house, not taking our eyes off the translucent figure as we went. When we were free from the bush house and close enough to home for us to feel out of danger and safe, we just looked at each other, very doubtfully. G suddenly said, Stay here. Don't move or speak. She ran to the garden shed and climbed up the side to the manky, rotting roof. I completely lost it, letting out a squeal of utter fear, quick-witted as usual. Al put her hand over my mouth and hushed me. Al and I watched while G looked over the hedgerow, which divided our back garden from the beginning of the heath. From our position, her face was clearly visible. G's expression was a mixture of confusion, surprise, and fright, and her pretty brown eyes looked troubled. We waited for G to come back to us before asking her in earnest what she saw. She didn't answer straight away, but when she did, she said, It was so strange. I didn't see anything. No dogs, no other animals. She paused, her young mind trying to summon the words to explain what she witnessed. There was a man. I saw the back of him walking away towards the iron fence. My seven-year-old's mind found it hard to comprehend what G was saying and one look at Elle told me she was experiencing the same. We both said together, What man, G? What did he look like? G sighed, biting her lip, a habit she still has today, when she's anxious, worried, or trying to explain something tricky or difficult. I didn't see him properly, his face and all that. 
I only saw his back. He did have really long, scruffy hair, though. Her eyes wandered over nervously to the end of the garden, leading out to the very public heath. Elle and I both followed G's gaze. We all shuddered. Nobody spoke for ages. For a long time, we sat in silence, G and L sitting on the back step, and me in my wheelchair alongside them. Suddenly, I noticed something and exclaimed to the others, Everything is back to normal. Listen. We all listened. The regular everyday noises had returned. The world appeared to have resumed business as usual. A while later, A and his two maids came back, and, sensing some tension between us, they asked us what was up. We did tell them everything, and two of them ran out to the back to have a look around. They were gone for about 45 minutes. When they returned, they said they didn't see anything, no strange man, no animals, nothing unusual or dodgy at all. We spent the rest of the day hanging out with the boys, eating dinner in the bush house and later watching films and eating junk food. We didn't tell mom about the experience until a few years back, long after we were grown, and we still don't know, or can't explain, what happened that day. This all took place a few days ago, still unsure as to what's going on. Anyway, I was sat in my room playing some Xbox when I heard what sounded like a dying animal coming from outside. I heard it a few times earlier that day, but this time it was much louder and much more aggressive. This of course freaked me out, so I went outside to investigate. For context, my window leads to my backyard, which is right next to a laneway, separated only by a crappy little fence. I walk outside and head to where my window is to find my dog going buck nutty at the fence, barking and scratching. The strange noise had stopped, but I realized that a bunch of other dogs in my street were also going crazy. I initially thought that maybe some strays were fighting and one had got injured, so I stuck my head over the fence to have a look, but nothing was there. I calmed my dog down and headed inside to the front window that looks out onto my street. Mind you, this window is quite hard to spot from the street, which makes this next bit extra freaky. The dogs in my street were all still going crazy, so I looked out the front window, expecting to see some dogs chasing each other or something like that, but all that I saw was a strange-looking man walking down the road. His back was turned to me, and I stared for a bit, trying to analyze the situation. That's when, out of nowhere, he turned full 180 and made direct eye contact with me. When his eyes met mine, I quickly ran from the window. I gathered my thoughts for a second or two and decided to look back out and see if he was still standing there. But nothing. No one. He was gone. The time between me leaving the window to me looking back to see nothing was much too short for him to have left. This whole experience left me quite shook and confused as to what I actually witnessed. I live somewhere in North Carolina. It's not a small city by any means, but it's basically a highway town at its core. I've lived here for 10 plus years. On the night in question, I was with my ex. We'll refer to her as Z. This was right around the time when COVID-19 restrictions had yet to be fully lifted. So Z invited me for a walk. She was finishing up her online courses for the semester, one being physical activity. So we'd often walk around her neighborhood to reach a daily amount of steps or something. Anyway, we head out on this walk. It's around 7 to 8 p.m., so on our way out, the sun is already setting. We stick to the street, as there isn't a sidewalk and we're just walking through the neighborhood. I've been down this area hundreds of times. I've drove there nearly every day to be with Z during the pandemic. 
It's just your average, single-story, cookie-cutter, every-house-looks-identical neighborhood. On our way back to the house, it's dusk, a weird time of day, especially on this evening. It was almost a gray-looking atmosphere, but still illuminated enough to see the streets. Z is on a phone call for the entirety of the way back, so I'm just taking in my surroundings and waiting for the walk to be finished. That's when I see it, whatever this thing was. About three houses down, mid-jump, arms and legs fully outstretched and leaping across the street. It lands on the other side in an instant, with barely enough time to register that anything had even happened at all. At the time, it felt like a hallucination, something fictional that my brain had just conjured up out of boredom or lack of visual content. It happened so quickly, but this flash frame is burned into my memory now and is something that I'll probably never forget. Firstly, it was huge and 100% silent. I only caught sight of it flying across the street and landing underneath a car. It was fully outstretched and took up almost the entirety of the street. Even with its hands on the ground, its rear legs were still stretched from the jump and extended far beyond the halfway point of this two-lane road. I can only guess the size of this thing was 10 to 20 feet in length. It looked extremely thin, but startlingly human from the waist up. 100% dark gray. Its arms seemed to be car length, with large claws, and its legs were bowed in a way that reminded me of a dog. The only feature I couldn't make out was its face. It seemed completely black, but scarily human. Again, At the time, I had no idea if what I saw was some sort of weird animal or just a hallucination. Even so, I kept my eyes glued to where I had seen this hallucination land. As I got closer and closer to the car, I almost wanted to freak out. Z was still on the phone though, so I decided to keep quiet and inspect the car for myself as we walked by. I turned my head as we slowly passed the vehicle. At this point, I'm convincing myself that what I had seen couldn't be possible, but I just couldn't bring myself to peer and look under that car. As we walk away, I turn back a few times, really trying to process if I lost my mind for a moment or not. By the time we got home, I almost feel embarrassed. Did I just have a stare down with a car for absolutely no reason? By the time we walk inside Z's house, she's off the phone. We were kind of bummed that our walk was void of conversation, so we just catch up and converse for the next half hour. The hallucination had almost completely left my mind at this point. We just ended up going about our usual business. Honestly, I was just happy to be spending time with my partner. I was ready to accept that what had happened earlier was nothing more than my imagination. I had forgotten about the experience almost entirely, until Z asked me out of almost nowhere, Did you see something jump across the street earlier? Last weekend, my five-year-old and I went tent camping in the Uintas northeast of Utah. The weather was overcast weather. By the time we got done paddleboarding, we made our way back to camp. Once we got back to camp, I couldn't shake this feeling of unease. I mostly shrugged it off, thinking I'm overthinking the safety of my child. One thing to point out, there was a trailer and a truck close to us, but I never saw anyone throughout our experience from there. At around 8 p.m., we started our campfire. We roasted brats and ate snacks. During this time, I would think I heard a crack or a subtle movement and thought it was just the embers popping. Once the sun finally set, I noticed it was completely pitch black 
outside the reach of our campfire, most likely due to the overcast weather. At this point, I decided it's time to pack up our food and take it to the car. But I had this sudden feeling that I was being watched, and I decided to turn my headlamp light on. I faced 30 degrees to the right in front of me. About 10 to 50 feet from us, I see a small bush-like tree. I want to explain. This small bush-like tree was not thick or sturdy enough for something big to lean on or climb onto. And above the tree, standing behind it, I see two big circle white eyes with a hint of purple staring straight at me. The animal creature was far enough from the glow of the fire that I couldn't see the silhouette of a body, but it was close enough that it was odd behavior and it was only seconds from us if it ran towards us. My first thought was that it was a bear standing on its hind legs, just being curious. It looked to be eight feet tall or so. As I had my light facing the creature, who was abnormally close to our campsite, I grabbed my kiddo and bear spray and told my kid that there's a bear behind the tree and assured him that we would be fine. This creature just watched us intently, Suddenly, a few seconds later, my intuition screamed, Get out, now! I then started walking backwards towards my car and told my kid to walk slowly with me. The creature made no movement and tilted its eyes on us as we moved away until my light could no longer reach it. I can't explain this new type of fear I was experiencing. It was unnatural. I think prioritizing my boy's safety allowed us to get to the car in a much more composed manner. Once in the car, we waited 30 minutes to see if it would come to the campsite to look for food, but nothing happened. I thought perhaps it left and we could sleep in the car to be safe. I decided that I'm going to try and grab blankets from the tent, put out the fire, and we can pack out first thing in the morning. I thought wrong. The campsite from the car was about 150 feet away. To the right of us were big trees, and to the left of us is tall grass and brush. I get out of the door and turn my headlamp on. My light shines towards the brush, and laying low in the brush, I see the white eyes again staring up at me. I decided to try and act big and yell out at the creature, but it made a move towards me, which in return made me jump back into the car and reverse. I tried to shine my car lights towards it and couldn't see anything. I decided to find help. I drive down and find a friendly fellow dad camper who was happy to help me pack up my things to leave. He arrives with a much brighter flashlight and his truck. As I am packing, he sees the eyes and mentions there's two of them. He states they're not moose, deer, cougars, and if it's a bear, it's really odd behavior, and he doesn't know exactly what they are. I face towards where he is shining the light, and I see a second pair of white eyes. At this point, I am terrified. One of them is standing tall, while the other is lower. This time, they are much further back, as if they now know there's a new reach limit to the light devices being used. It wasn't until the lower set of eyes decides to stand up and be much taller than the first one, looking monstrous. This made my new friend very uneasy, and he quotes, This has got me on edge. Let's just throw everything in your car and leave. The whole time, while we were packing out, I would catch these creatures making a perimeter around us. They just walked around the campground in circles, waiting for something, it seemed. To give some perspective on the scenario, we live in an apartment complex at the edge of town in Illinois. Right next to us is a woodsy area full of coyotes and deer, and lots of birds, so it's pretty lively. Last night, at 3 a.m., 
My fiancé went outside to grab a case of water from the trunk of our car. She claimed she heard someone say, Hello. Hello. In a girl's voice, coming from the woods. She couldn't see anything, but she replied back, confused, saying hello back. Whatever it was ended up saying, Can somebody help me? And that's when she got the chills and ran as fast as she could back into our house. Right before she entered the house, she said she heard it again, with the voice getting closer and asking for help. But instead of a normal girl voice, it turned into a girl voice that didn't even sound real. And she couldn't explain the change in the voice. She said afterwards, thinking about it, that her voice sounded familiar, but she couldn't point out whose voice it was. I live in Australia, and we don't have much woodlands here, besides a few that span on for a couple hundred acres or so. Nothing like what Americans have. And when I was younger, I would get lost in these woods a lot, and sometimes even sleep in them for a couple of days at most, surviving off fish and creek water. I never had any creepy encounters besides this one time. I was about 10 years old, and just like I do at least every two to three years, I had gotten lost in the woods again. I was completely fine during the day, as I had eaten an hour prior to realizing I had no idea where I was. I decided to walk around to find some sticks to make a little fire. I knew a lot about outdoor survival, as my family went camping a lot, and I watched videos on YouTube all the time since it interested me, and I loved the woods. I had set up a fire as it started getting dark, and was about to put out my fire before I saw a small deer on the tree line just nearly out of range of my fire's light. It was staring at me, which gave me some chills, but I just went, Ah, a little deer, and I waved to it. The deer scurried off into the bush behind it, and I couldn't see it anymore. Then I heard this really weird noise, like twigs snapping, and all of a sudden, a much larger deer came out of the same bush that I had just seen the smaller one jump into. At this point, I knew something was off, so I stood up and stared at the deer, and it stared back at me. I was mentally preparing myself for the idea that this thing could run at me. The deer started walking a bit towards me, and then I backed up a little and crouched down. But as the deer kept getting closer, and I kept backing up, I looked down and realized this thing had a hoof directly in the fire, and it wasn't reacting to it at all. This creeped me out. I mean, its fur was burning, and it was starting to burn its skin, but it just wasn't reacting. I immediately set off bolting, but I heard it coming behind me, not really running, but fast enough to keep up with my little legs. I came over this small hill and jumped down into a bush to try to hide, and that's when it happened. The scariest thing I have ever seen in my entire life and I remember it so vividly. The deer's silhouette against the moonlight appeared, and as I stared at the deer, it let out this blood-curdling call that I've never heard from another animal before, and all of a sudden, the silhouette started caving in on itself. I could hear the bone snapping and the flesh ripping, and this thing just kept getting smaller. Then suddenly, it got much bigger and I closed my eyes because I couldn't watch anymore. When I opened them, there was a man standing where the deer stood, or at least, the silhouette of a man. He was looking around, and then he started calling out in this creepy, almost distorted voice. Hello? Hello? And he repeated this for about ten minutes, while I just sat there in silence, refusing to answer. He stood just a couple meters above me. The man then just walked off into the trees, and I heard that same awful snapping noise 
before it eventually faded away. I didn't sleep that night. I stayed in that bush the rest of the night terrified that this thing could still be lurking around the area, waiting for me to appear again. Once the morning came, I walked a straight line until I reached a road I recognized, and then I ran home. I didn't tell my family about it, as I feared I wouldn't be taken seriously, but I was terrified. I haven't been to the woods since that day, and always stayed home when my family went camping after, begging them not to go. This happened when I was 15, in late 2009. I grew up in rural Denmark, and believe me, I have seen some bizarre things in the 20 years I lived there until I moved to Copenhagen. It was shortly after sunset in November when my friend Ina texted me saying I should come up to her place, which was not far from where I lived. It was already dark when I went up there, and I didn't think too much of it then, even though it was already kind of unsettling, particularly when I crossed by a certain little mount close to where she lived. She stood in front of the building she lived in, and at first she got me up to her room. She seemed rather off, and she immediately told me what bothered her once she closed the door. She told me that in recent days, whenever it had become dark, she had noticed a tall slender man stand underneath a streetlight down the street, and that he was a creepy weirdo. At first, I didn't think much of it, thinking she was exaggerating because she was venting out her frustrations about something in school. When we went outside and we walked a few meters down the street, we stopped, and that's where we saw him. Several meters away, he stood there, under a streetlight, leaning onto it, he was tall, slender, and he seemed to kind of glitter or sparkle under the lamp. I could not really see his face, except that I could see a wide grin, even from afar. He didn't move, except once among the times that my friend yelled slurs at him, and no, I don't think my friend should have done this. He just didn't move, and when he once did move, he turned his head in our direction. There was something off about it. It's hard to describe. We also never went further down to him. It was like there was a boundary that prevented us from doing so. Not to mention that I didn't want to be closer. But speaking of my friend yelling in his direction, that's where I noticed that the entire neighborhood was silent. Not just silent, but it seemed like the lights in each of the houses and buildings were off. It was actually as if life itself was switched off, and I otherwise heard nothing. No birds, no dogs, no cats, nothing. It was just plain silence. I asked my friend to stop, and we went back to her place. After an hour or so, I went home, and boy, did I not look forward to the walk down to my place after that encounter. As I walked down to the street, I made sure not to look in the direction where this man stood. As I went down the hill, something told me not to look back and to only go straight forward. And then I noticed the silence again. There's a highway on the other side of the already harvested cornfield, and there was no traffic there and no sounds. This silence was truly unsettling. And this is one of the first times I experienced the so-called Oz Factor, which I didn't know the name of until last year. This manipulated reality stopped the moment I opened my door to my home and my dog greeted me. The next day, when my parents were out working, Ina called me and said she wanted to come to my home, saying she had nightmares the previous night and that she felt that this man was after her, even if she couldn't see him. Ina arrived very scared at my house, and a few minutes after her arrival, my dog began barking hysterically outside, and I had never heard him growl or bark this hysterically. We went outside to the garden, and Ina said, 
It's him. It's him. But we only saw my dog barking in the air in the middle of the grass around the swing. Despite the fact that we didn't see anyone, I could feel the presence of someone, and I'm sure it was the man from the previous night. We went inside, took my dog in too, and we went to my room where my friend laid on my bed, having a bizarre seizure and basically entering a strange vegetative state and didn't respond to me. This lasted several minutes. It almost felt like I was doing some kind of exorcism as I constantly cried out to God for help, even though I had no idea what was happening and what I was doing exactly. And in case anybody wonders why I didn't call an ambulance, keep in mind I was 15, I didn't want any trouble, and no one would have believed any of the stuff I have told that had happened before the seizure. Suddenly, she woke up from that state, and she simply said that she had passed out. Nothing happened over the next hour, though everything felt really weird. We never spoke of the encounter afterwards. It was only a year later that I learned of the grinning man, how he had been seen around Point Pleasant during the time the Mothman haunted the place in the 60s, and how terrified people have been of that grin. I should mention here that he is often lumped together with the entity of injured cold. But apart from grinning and probably being from space, these two entities don't have anything in common, as injured cold was able to proper communicate with humans and had an interest in humanity. Around the time I learned of who the grinning man was, another friend told me that her brother and his friends had an encounter with him in the forest in daylight. It was the previous year, and maybe even during the same time when I had my encounter. They had a walk in the forest, and then they saw someone from the side. Under the shadows, they saw this tall, slender figure, kind of greenish, staring at them with wide eyes and a wide, fixed grin. They all ran away in terror from what they saw. I love... How despite that this entity has been seen by many around the world, still essentially nothing is known about him whatsoever. I do hope that I never have a similar encounter again, yet I would personally love to hear other people's encounters with him. Around 20 years ago, I had multiple encounters within hours of each other, that started two decades of strange instances. I grew up and have lived in West Michigan my whole life. I've lived for being outdoors, hiking, riding bikes on family property, doing night walks to listen to the nightlife, and have never been afraid of being alone in nature at any time of day or night. When I was in my teens, a bout of depression led me to late night walks by myself for miles at a time, and through some very thick woods and fields, never had a flashlight, and never even had a knife for protection. I have no fear of being in the woods alone, in the darkness, and completely unarmed. But I am almost 40 now, and with everything I have experienced and everything that has happened to me, I know to the bottom of my soul and heart, we are not even close to understanding our world. So this summer day that started it was our normal every day. The group of us all decided to go to a spot on Lake Michigan at Duck Lake State Park. It was busy, and shortly after arriving, one of my buddies, we'll call him S, ran into a girl that he worked with at one of our local taverns. S didn't know her too well, but well enough that she decided to come back with us and join us camping. Growing up where we did, even kids from other schools we would know pretty well and hang out with and party with. We spent a few hours there, and everything was like any other summer day, but that would change within hours and make all of us realize that reality really is more fascinating and terrifying than any science fiction that your mind can create. We ended up back at my friend's, calling him W, house around 3-ish in the afternoon. We had to pack up the tent, sleeping bags, and other normal gear for a night out. We had one tent, and with it being six guys and one girl, 
We all instantly agreed that the guys would sleep around the fire and that the girl, named T, would have the tent to herself. We got everything and started the long, grueling, and treacherous hike. I'm joking. It was roughly only 600 to 650 yards through the field to the woods behind W's house. This kind of makes it worse, as we were always in these woods, hunting, exploring, and looking for old property foundations. If we walked to the edge of the woods, we could see the house and the road across the field. This field normally was planted with corn, but was redone for hay this year and made the visibility great and got us excited for hunting in the fall. We were maybe 20 to 25 yards into the woods, and being older growth, we were completely out of sight while at the campsite. We started the fire around 8, and we all sat around it talking and joking like we would any other time that we were all together. I made dinner over the fire, and I jokingly told T that the steaks might get the coyotes' attention. She didn't do too much outdoors, as the rest of us, but she said that she would love to see one in person, and that she hoped to see more wildlife than just that. Well, she would get her wish, and so much more than any of us could have ever expected. As the night moved in, and the summer weather couldn't be better, we heard the deer start moving through the woods, keeping their distance. The coyotes were howling, and we could estimate they were a mile or so away, most likely at the farmer down the road's place. T had moved her seat into the opening of the tent, trying to keep the mosquitoes away, because for some reason the bug spray was not working on her, and we all were about to lay down. One by one, leaving myself and T still up, everyone laid down and got settled into their sleeping bags. All of the guys were laid out in a circle around the fire, like the numbers of a clock. We had only the knives for cooking and our personal pocket knives. My brother, calling him X, always has been a knife fanatic, so he had a couple on him, but none bigger than a medium-sized bowie. This is where it all starts, and where my time in the woods changes. He and myself decided that we would join the rest and lay down for the night. She asked if I would need help in the morning going back to the house to grab the stuff for breakfast, and I declined the help, as it wasn't much I left, and I knew she would appreciate the extra sleep as she had work the next night. As she zipped the tent, and I started to lay down, the woods started to feel different. They felt heavy, confining, dark, and almost unwelcoming. As my head was just getting to my pillow, the brightest light I have ever seen shone right down on top of our spot. It was even brighter than looking directly at the sun, and there was a heat that was projected with it. We were all up and trying to understand what was going on. T was the only one not out and looking to see what was going on. She thought we were all messing with her until she heard us all basically wigging out for a minute. Just as she was unzipping the tent, the light started to move away and to the south. There was no noise and no other lights we could make out. The neighbor to the south was known for growing pot in the fields around us, so we all agreed it was the police dope scope helicopter in silent mode, and the thermal camera on it saw our fire and they were checking it out. Just as we were getting settled back, there was the most terrifying scream a screech sound that hurt our ears. We all instinctively, and what seemed naturally, made a shield wall with our bodies around the fire. We don't really remember how T ended up in the middle, as none of us even remember her opening the tent. But she was already in tears and shaking so bad, you could feel it through the ground. Right after the screaming stopped, there was a loud thud on the forest floor, that broke downed branches and seemed to have a force to it that resonated in the ground and through the air itself. The creature then did laps around us so fast that it was even hard to keep track of where it was at any point. It stayed just out of the light, so all that you could get were glimpses of a shadow moving between the trees. 
Before we even realized what was going on, T, S, and W all seemed to teleport into the tent in fear. They moved so fast, it was like they teleported, just like T being in the middle of us when we all defensed up. The creature was running on all fours, but it looked like when a human tries to imitate a dog or a horse while walking on all fours. But this thing was running, and only a time or two, I could make out gray and white fur in patches. No pattern to the fur, just random patches of the two colors. When it stopped moving, it was dead silent. But none of us could pinpoint where it stopped. It moved so fast, it was a blur of sound and shadows around us. And at that point while looking for it, we could see the helicopter didn't leave and was blocking out stars as it strafed from west to east, as if still watching us. There was no sound, no craft sound, no creature sound, and no insects to be heard. The coals of the fire even seemed quiet, though they were popping and still very hot and actively burning off. We slowly, and one by one, started laying back down. The stars were no longer being blocked, and there was no movement in the woods. Crickets slowly started to chirp again. The fire was now back to life, and burning bright after I added a few branches. We all drifted off slowly for the next few hours of sleep that we were able to get. The night ended, and we didn't see or hear anything after that. In the morning, I was the first to wake, and I took my time getting up. There was nothing disturbed, broken, or taken. Everyone was there, and breathing thankfully with even T having the tent unzipped at the bottom, just enough that I could see her tossing in her sleeping bag. I decided to head up and get the food for breakfast. Everything was normal on the walk back, with the exception of having the feeling of being watched from the woods. The way back to the campsite, though, would be interesting to say the least. In the field, there was a distinct triangular set of circles in the hay growing. Not quite a perfect triangle. The left side was farther out than the two right ones by the distance between them. I wrote it off as it was the helicopter, and we all just somehow didn't hear them land. As I got closer to the edge of the woods by the campsite, a feeling of being watched hit me so hard there was no denying it. I turned around, and in a strip of trees that splits the two fields, there stood what I can only describe as half wolf and half great ape, stood by one of the biggest trees in the strip. It looked very uncomfortable, standing on two legs, at about six or seven feet tall. It held one hand against the tree, and it was swaying side to side as if off balance. I stared for a few minutes, maybe out of the fear, or maybe the thought of, don't move and they won't see you, before turning slowly and heading to the campsite. I said nothing to the rest of them, and made breakfast like nothing happened. About three hours later, we headed back to the house, and the being was not there, but the feeling of being watched never went away. The next encounter with this creature would be almost four years later, while hunting family property. This was only about four miles from the original encounter, and I was only about 150 yards from my relative's house. These were old growth woods, very thick underbrush, but the whole family was in these woods all the time. We picked berries, did animal sighting walks, and kept track of the hawks and animals and the health of the woods. At this time, I had a Remington 270 and sighted it at 100 yards. The year before, I threaded the needle at 75 yards to get my buck, so I was very comfortable with this long-range rifle in very thick, very limited shooting lanes. I had three lanes that were perfect for the shot, but the deer had to take certain trails to get to them. I saw a few does moving in and was getting excited that shortly behind would be one of the bucks we had been watching all year. 
The does moved in, and I'm always amazed at how animals with some good size can move through the berry thickets with ease, all while making minimal sound. I watched as they moved through the brush, and the largest doe kept looking behind. She was hearing something that I could not, and even using the scope, I couldn't make out anything. Then, without any warning, they all jumped together and rushed out of the woods. They were in such a rush, some even ran into trees and bounced off them into the southern field, and they all booked it all the way out of sight. I have never seen or heard anything as to why they would have just left like that. Then, I did see why. A gray and white furred creature on all fours slowly comes into sight. I knew immediately what I was looking at. This time, there was no fear, no anxiety, and no racing heart. I was completely calm, and as it moved, I felt that it knew that I was there, but it didn't care. It lunged across my shooting lanes like it knew I was armed. I have a strong feeling that any cryptid interaction should be viewed as a glimpse into the unknown and a moment to think about what we don't know and don't understand. Strong reactions such as intimidation and even fatal actions should only be a last resort. These creatures have spent all this time hiding and being just shadows, and have not, for the most part, made it their priority to act on us as alpha predators. It moved through and continued on its path, stalking the deer. Roughly 30 minutes pass, and I decided, after the creature coming through, that my hunting was done for the day and I headed home. When I entered the field, I could see the house. A rush of wind hit me, and I knew before looking up what I was going to see. There was the craft, triangular in shape, but the sides looked as if you filled the triangle with water until it was almost bursting. I knew this was the same craft from the camping trip, and everything made more sense on how it was so quiet. It moved in the direction of the creature, and then left the opposite direction so fast it had to have covered dozens of miles in a second. It made no sound, and it had a very direct flight line that moved north and then climbed elevation through the clouds. It would be over a decade and over 60 miles before I would see this being again, but it would not be alone. Only about three years ago now, I have moved south in Michigan. I have kids and have seen and interacted with many more unknown entities. I was hunting the state game area around Elegant. The city people who come in want to set up RV groups, hunt 10 feet from their camper, and mainly make the area a big drinking party that ruins the hunt for others. Due to this, I went to hunt a difficult area, but nobody wanted to go with me because mainly they're lazy. I moved a good few hundred yards into some thick woods and settled down. With the area, I had a shotgun as the rules restrict the firearms you are able to use. As I sat there, I started to hear some does moving in. The sun was just up and able to break into the thick woods and you could see as far as the trees would allow. The area I was in has been known for some unsettling interactions with the unknown and the weird. This morning was cooler than the last few and it was as if even the chipmunk's breath was visible. I saw the does moving in, and with them I was hoping a buck wouldn't be far behind. As they moved through with no care in the world, I noticed that there was breathing coming from behind one shrub. I was excited, thinking it was a buck, and maybe he could smell me or knew something was wrong. Then a moment that had been forgotten for the most part almost replayed before my eyes. The does ran for it. The creature came out, but this time the feeling was so much different. My anxiety maxed, my heart felt as if it was going to explode, and my fight or flight was flipping back and forth, almost to the point of passing out. 
The creature moved after the does, but I was still in full panic and needed to get the hell out of there. I moved through the woods, trying to stay as silent as I could, and get cell service to call the in-laws to come help me. As I moved and got within 200 yards of my vehicle, the woods went silent. I mean horror film silent. Roughly 75 yards ahead was a creature on all fours, front half fully exposed, but this wasn't the gray and white one that I saw just minutes before. This one was bigger, broader, and brown and black. This one was staring right at me, and the growl it let out was like a grouse, just stronger. Those who don't know, a grouse has a warning that is more felt than heard. It rumbles in the ears and can be felt in the chest. This thing's growl almost hurt, like physically hurt in my chest and ears. Five minutes of pure fear with this thing staring at me, and I thought, where is the other one? Where is the gray beast, and was it stalking me from behind? Then my saving grace moment, a huge gust of wind raced through the woods, and the creatures ran like its life depended on it. I had almost a wash of comfort, of warmth or relief, as the creatures fled. As I leaned against a tree in relief, I felt I needed to look up. I knew what I was about to see, but I was wrong. There was no triangular craft that I could make out. Just the clouds were warped, like when there is a defect in glass, or when the heat radiating from something hot distorts the view. Could it have been the same craft? Maybe it was hiding itself being daytime, or maybe it was something different altogether. I got out of there, and I haven't said a thing to anyone, because I learned, sometimes it's better, and the history the area already has, I didn't want to add to the anxiety it can produce, being a very good hunting area. Since the hunting trip and being in those woods many times after, I keep seeing the same creatures. Now it's very different. Now it's more, I guess, connected. They both appear in the shadows at night. They just sit at the edge of the shadows, but are not themselves. They now seem spectral. They appear hollow and fog-like. They give me more of a feeling of a guardian or a guide. I get more of a watcher feeling. And as of last night, September 10th, 2023, even living near a larger city doesn't keep them from showing. While smoking a cigarette before bed, both were only 10 yards away, watching, and almost like calling me to come to them. They only show up randomly, and the weather, humidity, moon phase, nothing seems to be attached to their visits. My husband and I went camping for the first time ever in Arizona as part of our long trip out west. I had picked out this really cool place that was on a mountain overlooking a beautiful landscape. It's next to a cliff and in a really isolated location. I'm talking like 20 miles out on gravel roads in the middle of a national forest. So we get there and set up our tent and hike a little bit and take pictures of the surrounding area. We see a few cars parked around two tents and decide to stop and talk to the other campers nearby because we had heard that there was going to be a bad storm that night. These were four guys who were from Arizona and they told us not to worry and that the storm didn't get that terrible around this area. That was all the persuading that we needed to stay. Later on, while walking a bit further down the campsite, we see a woman with her dog and another older lady. We smile and wave and continue to hike down a bit further into the forest. Because of the storm, we are one among maybe a total of seven campers that decided to stay and withstand the night. We watch the sunset when we get back to our site, make sure our car is only a few yards away, and go into our tent when it gets too dark to see. There are no stars tonight, 
due to the storm clouds, and it hasn't began to rain yet, so we decide to try to sleep right away so we could possibly sleep through the storm when it does hit. It's an insanely windy night, so it's hard to sleep, but eventually we get a bit of shut-eye. I wake up at 10.30 p.m. to the sound of some crazy thunder rolling through the mountains and the rain hitting down on our tent. I'm a little freaked out because they get a lot of flash floods out here and I didn't want to fall off the side of the cliff. But I tell myself to try to sleep and eventually I doze off again. It's 12 a.m. and I awake again, this time because I hear something heavy hitting the side of our tent. It full-on sounded like someone could have been punching our tent and sliding something down the side of it. I open my eyes and I can't see anything. It's completely dark, no light whatsoever. The sound continues every couple of minutes. Suddenly, I hear footsteps right next to my side of the tent. They are slow, but steady. I seriously start thinking about how this is it, and I'm going to die. My heart is beating so fast that I'm certain that whatever is out there can hear it. Then, whatever it is, lets out a deep sigh right on the opposite side of the tent. I'm thinking it's a bear and realizing that I might actually have to face this thing. So in a desperate call for my husband's mind-reading powers, I squeeze his hand really hard repetitively and he wakes up. But instead of reading my mind, he blurts out, What's wrong? Why are you squeezing my hand? Right as he says this, the footsteps stop. I don't hear the footsteps again. So after a while, I break out of my frozen state and tell him what I heard. We decided it may have been an animal passing by. But whatever is hitting our tent continues every so often, and I'm starting to go a little insane from this night, wondering what's going on. We convince ourselves that it's just pine needles falling from the trees above us, and we try to sleep again. We just need to make it through one night, then we can laugh about this all in the morning. A couple of minutes go by, and suddenly, the tent caves in on my husband's side, right on his head. He whispers that it feels like something is pushing the tent down. I feel my heart instantly sink. I'm freaking out, thinking it's a bear that just sat on his head, but he decides to push back and we hear the familiar noise of something sliding off of our tent that we've been hearing for the past few hours. We then realize that it's been snowing outside and that the noise that we heard hitting our tent was heavy ice falling from the trees onto our tent. Our tent is covered in thick ice and my husband pushes off the tent from the inside until all of the ice slides off. Still determined to make it through the night and a little relieved that it was just ice and not a bear, we try to sleep and make it to sunrise. We keep on a small light that my husband, luckily, brought with him just to calm us down a little. Things are starting to seem normal again and we both close our eyes. It's 3 a.m. at this point, not even 30 minutes after we are settling down, and my literal worst nightmare happens. Out of the pitch black night, we hear a woman screaming. We distinctly hear her say, what the hell? Oh my God, what the hell? Followed by some other non-tangible words that sound something like help. The way that she screams doesn't sound like anger, it sounds like pure terror and a sense of panic. My husband and I are both frozen, looking at each other. I quickly shut off our light and start panicking and asking what we should do. How is this really happening right now? While we are trying to decide what to do for the next few minutes, we hear her again. But this time she is screaming, No, 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 no as we hear a car speed off into the night. I'm in tears at this point. We have no idea what's happening. It's dead silent now, save for the icy rain hitting our tent. It definitely sounded like she wasn't in the car, 
but more like she was desperately yelling after it or begging not to be hurt. And this, this was the breaking point. Because I could take the bad weather, I could take the possible bear outside my tent, I could even take the ice falling on our heads in one of the warmest states in America. But one thing I cannot and will not ever be able to handle is a screaming person in the middle of pitch black woods at 3 a.m. We decide to get out of there and even contemplate leaving our tent and booking it to our car. But instead, we try to stay level-headed and grab our valuables and put them in the car first. We frantically gather all of our things and stay close as we shuffle to our car. I close the door and keep the lights off for a while, scared to attract any unwelcome visitors. And while my husband goes back to grab the tent, I start the car and call 911. I tell them what I heard and where we are, and they say that they're sending someone to the campsite to make sure everything is okay. Only thing is, we are literally in the middle of nowhere, and it will definitely take them more than an hour to arrive. Not to mention, the storm left those gravel roads in some pretty terrible conditions. So my husband and I decide to start driving. It's like 3.30 a.m. now. As we drive out of the campsite, my husband notices one last eerie detail that stuck with me. The four guys that we had talked to earlier had left. All three of their cars were gone, while their tents remained. Whatever scared them off, they sure left in a hurry. It was only after we started driving that the thought occurred to me, whatever was walking next to my tent may not have been an animal. It very well could have been someone lurking around in the dark who decided to go after the girl we had previously seen on our hike. I'm not quite sure what went down on that lone mountain that night, and I hope that everyone got out okay. I called the police department back to follow up and was told that the cops searched the area for a few hours and talked with a few people who were still there, but didn't find anything. I had spent the better part of a week camping in the desert and stopped at the Taco Bell in Kayenta, Arizona on my way back to southern Utah, where I lived at the time. When I sat down, an older man with a limp walked over and asked if he could join me. I felt a little strange about it, but I hadn't spoken to anyone in days and could use some conversation. He opened up to me, told me a little bit about his past on the Navajo reservation, his estranged family, some verses from the Bible, he was a Christian convert, and how a local pastor at a church had been helping him to get back on his feet. I was unsure if he was evangelizing or maybe wanting some cash or something else completely. I'm still unsure, in fact. Then his story turned dark. He started talking about seeing ghosts and how he had been possessed by a demon twice. Maybe he still was. He wanted to show me videos on his phone of one of the spirits in his house. I watched a blurry streak of color that appeared in the middle of the kitchen on his phone, but it looked like there was a filter applied to the video, and it could have just been some sort of reflection or interference. I was unconvinced, but there was a feeling of uneasiness settling into my stomach. The story continued for a while until I told him I had to be headed home, when he asked me for a ride to his house around the block. He had a limp and it took him 20 minutes to walk home in the cold, but it would only be a three minute drive. Again, very uneasy, but I said yes. I mean, after hearing his story and the hurt and struggle in his voice, I felt compelled to at least help him in this small way. He expressed a lot of gratitude when I said yes, he directed me down the main road, away from the business strip in Kayenta, toward a very dark block of scattered homes and open desert. The uneasiness turned into dread, and I kept asking him over and over where his house is, and he would just say, It's right up there. The thought that he may have a weapon crossed my mind as we were heading farther away from traffic, lights, and people around the main strip of town. 
we entered what looked like a run-down, abandoned subdivision of very small homes with the occasional working streetlight. I didn't see a single sign of occupancy, no lights in the houses, no cars in the driveway, until two silhouettes of men seemingly appeared from nowhere and walked across the street in front of me, only to disappear again. I was terrified as I asked him again where his house was. He sensed my uneasiness and assured me it was just around the corner. Sure enough, we turned the corner and there was a little house, same as all the others, with a light on inside. I could let him get out here, he said, and he thanked me and said God bless you and walked to the front door of the house that was supposedly occupied by spirits. It was a bizarre encounter and I just have this feeling, even now, that I met this man for a reason that I don't understand. I've questioned whether or not the man actually existed or if I imagined him. In any case, I felt these feelings of unease, dread, sympathy, and anxiety that I have never experienced in the same way. This happened this morning around 1.30 or 2 a.m. in a large park on the edge of a Phoenix, Arizona suburb. I'm not too familiar with skinwalkers, I'll admit. I have heard them by virtue of growing up in the desert, as well as a casual fascination with spooky stories. This morning, I was meeting up with an old friend from high school around 1 a.m. at a nearby park to booze and catch up on life while walking around the field. We heard a loud, repetitive noise coming from the park that I assumed to be a coyote, but it didn't stop. It almost sounded like a soundbite of a child wailing, but choppily and perfectly repeated. The noise had a sort of mechanical element to it, if that makes sense. We would hear it for intervals of about 10 seconds, then it would stop for a few, and then start again. We were both immediately perturbed and headed back for the car to hang out in the parking lot close by. As we walked away toward the car, however, the noise ceased. Unfortunately, when we arrived at the parking lot, my friend realized he had forgotten his phone somewhere in the field where we had heard that strange, loud noise. We drove back and ran to go pick up the phone and found it. But when we entered the park, the noise started again, but this time from a different corner of the park. Naturally, we bolted out of there, and the rest of the night was fine. My family has always had these strange encounters with skinwalkers for as long as I can remember, but this one is the most chilling. A little context beforehand. This story involves my mother's cousin, who lived not far from us. This story is told from different family members, herself, her son, and my aunt. My mother's cousin had always been an outgoing person, always meeting people, she was practically the life of any party. She had been in a very long relationship with her two kids' father for years, and when that ended, she became a single mother for years. Meeting someone new was not her top priority, but after being single for a while, she had met someone. She had fallen head over heels in love with him, and so did her kids. He was not a bad guy, and he did truly care for her and her kids. But after being together for a year, they both began being plagued by a skinwalker. Things started out small, like small taps on the windows, to hearing whispers outside their bedroom window. But with each visit, things got worse. One of the first encounters that happened, they had been asleep when her boyfriend had awoken in the middle of the night and needed to use the restroom. On the reservation, indoor plumbing and running water was still non-existent, so he had to do his business outside in the outhouse. 
He explained that he was then hit with a strong smell of decay and death. Wondering what that smell was and not really wanting to find out, he quickly finished and made a quick dash back to the house. As he neared the back door, he made one last look towards the outhouse. He said that he really wished he hadn't done this. Next to the outhouse stood a black figure. It was gaunt and rail thin, as he stared at it, he said it hunched over and stood on all fours like a dog. Thinking it was his eyes playing tricks on him, he blew it off and went back to bed. The following day, everything appeared to be normal again, and he never mentioned the encounter to his girlfriend. Weeks went by, and gradually, the skinwalker visits became more intense. The next encounter was more frightening my mother's cousin had explained that they were all outside the house enjoying the night. They had been smoking cigarettes and talking. It was getting late, and she decided that she was going to bed. Her boyfriend told her he would be in shortly after, that he wanted to have one more cigarette before bed. As she was getting ready for bed, her boyfriend had come running through the door, pale and visibly shaken. Startled by his appearance, she asked him what was wrong. After he had calmed down, he told her that as he was finishing the last of his cigarette, he heard a scratch on the roof of the house. Thinking it was one of the cats that had gotten stuck up there, he walked a few steps backwards to see if he could see the cat on the roof. Only instead, he saw a black figure sitting on top of the roof, its face painted black and white, and some kind of animal skin on top of its head. Frightened, he ran back inside. Normally, with an encounter, traditional beliefs say that it's best to contact a shaman and have a ceremony done. But because her boyfriend was an outsider, he never believed in our traditional beliefs and refused to take part in any of it. Again, things went on. Whenever she visited family, she appeared in distress and didn't know how to handle the situation. Things again increased in severity. This encounter happened maybe one or two months after the initial encounter and was told to us by her eldest son. He said that his mother was out running a quick errand for a family friend, while him, his younger brother, and his mother's boyfriend stayed home. He said that they had just finished watching a movie. Her boyfriend had gone back to their room while he and his brother went back to their room to play some video games. Maybe 15 minutes had passed when he heard his mother's boyfriend scream. Startled, he quickly got up and ran to their room, her boyfriend quickly running past him and running out the door. Stepping outside, he called out for him for a few minutes and he finally came slowly walking around the corner of the house. His face looked shocked with fear. He walked quietly past him and back into the house. Sitting down on the couch across from him, he asked him what the hell happened. Taking a few deep breaths, he answered. He had been sitting on the bed, about to get ready for bed, when he heard whispers and taps on the window behind him. Thinking it was his stepson or the youngest brother playing a joke on him, he quickly got up and pulled the shade apart, coming face to face with a skinwalker. He locked eyes with it and described it again with its face being painted, wearing an animal pelt on top of its head, and its eyes glowed an unnatural color. Frightened, he asked him where he and his younger brother were at, and they sat in his room playing video games. Growing concerned, her son finally asked his mother to please speak to his grandma about the encounter. Not really sure what to do, she finally relented and went against her boyfriend's wishes and sought spiritual help from a shaman. Afterwards, things seemed to get better and the encounter stopped and everything seemed to get back on track for them but skip ahead several months later. That's when the most terrifying incident happened. This part of the story was told to us by my aunt after she made a visit to her. 
After my mother's cousin had visited the shaman, things seemed to get better, and they had not experienced anything from the skinwalker for some time. But one night, things went from bad to worse. They had been up for a while, talking and laughing, feeling things had gotten better. She had decided it was time for bed, but her boyfriend wanted to finish up the last of his cigarette. Unbeknownst to her, something was happening outside as she lay in her bed. Her boyfriend had finally come back inside and had gotten in bed. They had both been asleep for a few hours. She was then awoken with her boyfriend on top of her, strangling her. Terrified, she screamed. Her two kids had come in, only to see him still choking and punching her. Quickly, her two boys pushed him off her. She grabbed her kids and ran to the door. Turning back, they said that they saw him kneeling on the floor in a daze and wondering what was going on. Once he realized what happened, he quickly got up and ran out of the house. Still in shock, they ran a hundred yards to her parents' house and quickly called the police. Within an hour, they had arrived and began searching for the boyfriend to make sure he hadn't disappeared or hurt himself. They finally found him, but I don't remember where. It had been a few weeks when we learned what happened to her from my aunt. We learned that he had been sent to jail for the assault and served some serious jail time. We also learned that she had been helped through a spiritual healer, and according to him, on the night of the attack when he wanted to finish his smoke, he had been confronted by a skinwalker. He said that the skinwalker wanted him to harm her and then harm himself, but during the attack something had happened and he was unable to do it. This story still sends chills down my spine as to what could have happened. Luckily, she survived, and as of today, she's happily married and has expanded her family. I believe I saw what a lot of people call a not deer last fall. I figured this as good as a place as any to post, since I see the term not deer tied in with skinwalkers and other similar creatures pretty often. There isn't a lot to this story, but it stuck with me, and every time I think about it, I feel really uneasy. I live in Colorado, in a mountain town south of Denver. I live off a winding back road through a valley. One side of the road is right against a rock, steep like a wall in some places and more sloping in others and the other side kind of drops off into the valley. Also might be worth noting that the mountain on the other side of the valley is a huge burn site with nothing but skeleton trees. I've heard a couple of stories that have taken place near burn sites, so maybe there's some correlation. This was probably around late August, early September. I was driving home late, probably around 1 a.m., I know the road and all of the curves pretty well, so I was going at pretty decent speed. I wasn't being as actively aware of my surroundings as I should have been, especially since deer and elk are pretty common here. Anyway, I was coming up on the last curve before my street, and I saw a deer standing at the side of the road on the side with the rock face. This deer was standing completely still, facing the rock wall. That in itself doesn't sound too strange, I know, but there was just something unnatural in its stillness, and the fact that it was staring straight into the rock, nowhere it could go, was odd. But what has stuck with me is the feeling I immediately got upon seeing it. Just an ungodly pit in my stomach, it felt like my heart stopped. And this wasn't the, oh crap, the deer on the side of the road surprised me kind of stomach pit. This was an absolute feeling of dread. It also seemed like there was just something off about the deer. For the life of me, I can't picture it in my head or pinpoint what it was, but something proportion-wise was wrong. Like maybe its legs were a little too long or its torso was stretched out, I'm not sure. I didn't have time to react, I just kept driving. 
As I rounded the curve, I literally could not take my eyes off the rearview mirror. And the thing didn't move at all. Not a flinch. Nothing. Just stone still. Even after it was behind the curve and I couldn't see it anymore, I still couldn't peel my eyes off the rear view. I pulled into the garage and hit the garage door before I had even parked. And when I got out of the car, I couldn't stop myself from running up the stairs. I couldn't shake the feeling of dread, like I was in danger. I'm not by any means superstitious. I like stories about cryptids and I think they're super interesting, but I've never really believed them. But since that night, as short-lived as that encounter was, if there was one supernatural thing I believe in, it was that creature. I know in my gut it wasn't just a deer. It's also worth noting that after I told my visiting friend about the experience, she admitted that that year, when she was visiting for the first time, she had felt a similar dread and pit in the stomach as we had approached that same spot. My aunt worked for a public service company in our small town in New Mexico that helped people that were in the streets who were homeless or in need of a place to stay. Most times they would get calls from the local police or nearby hospitals if someone was either intoxicated or just needed a warm bed. Her position at the company was a driver. When they received a call, she was tasked with picking them up. On this night, things took a terrifying turn. Local police had gotten several calls from a nearby neighborhood of someone walking around the area and were afraid he may break into somebody's house. Dispatch had sent out a unit to see what was going on. Once they were there, they had found a male wandering the nearby foothills. At this point, the company was called and were asked to send one of their crew to pick up the person. A company van was sent that had just picked up a couple of people and was already en route. When they got to the neighborhood, the van pulled up to the police. The driver, who was a close friend to my aunt, said the two officers were frightened and looked like they had seen a ghost. One of the officers brought the individual out of the squad car. One terrified look from the driver, and he knew what they were picking up. It was a skinwalker. Horrified and not wanting to touch this thing, he led him to the back of the van. Confused, his partner asked him what was wrong. His only response was, Let's get back fast. I don't want to be around this thing for too long. His partner opened up the back of the van, and much to the shock of the other passengers, the skinwalker got in and quickly squeezed into one side of the van. Once back at the main facility, the two men led the people inside. My aunt saw what was walking in and she was terrified. She asked her friend if she could handle the check-in by herself, while she excused herself to another part of the building. When everyone was checked in, my aunt told them to turn in whatever valuables they had. As everyone had finished taking everything out of their pockets, the only one who hadn't was the skinwalker. There were only two people brave enough to go through its pockets, and what they find scares them even more. As they start pulling items out of its pockets, they were shocked at what they found. They begin pulling out strands of hair, fingernails, pieces of small bones, and cigarette butts. It also wore a small pouch around its neck. By this point, the staff were so scared that they refused to look inside. They all decide to let it leave. She explained as it walked out, they quickly locked the doors and stayed inside until the morning. The following day, as they let out many of the people who stayed the night, many of them told the staff that they heard knocks on the windows and eerie whispers through the night, many refusing to look out the window. Back in 2015, my brother worked for a security guard hiring place. Not exactly sure what you call it. 
Basically, he'd call and they'd station him in some place or another that needed it. So this particular time, my brother got hired by the local cemetery. They'd had issues with kids sneaking in at night and messing things up, and at one point, they even broke a couple graves. Anyway, his job was just to drive around the cemetery and make sure no one was messing around. This area was pretty rural and at the time had a pretty bad stray dog problem. Dogs would get lost or people would drop them off and they would form packs and roam the countryside. On this particular night, my brother was in the cemetery and noticed a pretty big pack of dogs, about eight or so, just wandering around and playing. There was a big Rottweiler, a couple of mixed breed dogs, and even a little Bichon Frise that was clearly someone's pet at some point because it still had a harness on. So my brother is doing his rounds, and he's driving really slowly with the window down. He has his arm out of the window with the spotlight, and it's pitch black at this point. Suddenly, he hears the dogs going crazy, and then he hears what he best described as the screaming bird from the Swamp episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, but deeper and more human-like, with a rattling sound mixed in like a rattlesnake's tail. The dogs go silent before starting back up again, barking and snarling a few minutes later. Then something fast and pale runs in front of his headlights, with the eight dogs in pursuit, barking and snarling. He decides to follow the dogs in fear that they're getting ready to tear someone's pet to pieces. He parks his car, gets out with a spotlight, and then follows the sound of the barking. He then hears the scream again and swears that he heard a faint help, mixed in with the weird screeching and rattling. He gets to where the dogs are going nuts and shines his light, and is surprised to see that the dogs have a deer. He said that this deer was a pale gray color. It was skinny and emaciated, and then he shined the light on its eyes. They're black, he said, but no light reflected off of them and had no shine whatsoever. They looked like the eyes of something dead. He is understandably confused, and he's standing there, a few yards away from a pack of angry, snarling dogs that haven't even registered that he's there. The dogs have this deer surrounded and are taking turns nipping at its hind end and legs, but my brother notices that every time they do, they recoil and sort of gag as if the taste is appalling to them. My brother then hears a deep growling from behind him. This big Rottweiler bowls past him and launches itself at the deer, grabbed its hind legs and with a mighty shake knocks the thing over and just starts wailing on it. He then says the deer let out a screech again and then it takes its hoof and swipes, yes he said swipes, at the dog. The dog lets go and the thing takes off, the dogs are hard on its heels. He never did guard work at that cemetery again, but he did go back a few days later and managed to get that little Bichon Frise to come with him. And he's had that dog for the last five years. We live in Utah, and my uncle Mark went on a mission at 19. They sent him to a Native American reservation in Arizona and paired him with a companion named Carl. When they first got there, there was a huge rift with the locals on the reservation with them being there. They didn't want my uncle and Carl staying on the reservation. Eventually, they came to a compromise that they would stay on the outskirts in a trailer. The reservation wasn't very big and was located next to a heavily wooded area. The first night, they were trying to sleep, when all of a sudden, their trailer started to shake violently back and forth. Startled and not sure what was happening, they climbed under the table for cover. Mark could distinctly hear someone pushing it from both sides of the trailer, like a group of people. After about five minutes, it stopped. That next day, they made rounds on the reservation and were talking to the locals. Carl made a comment to one of the families that their trailer was shaking the night before. The family got very quiet and told them they had to leave. They thought it was strange, but they didn't think much of it. The next night, it happened again. They woke up to their trailer shaking back and forth. 
Again, they climbed under their table until it stopped. This went on for two more nights. Anytime they tried to talk to anyone about it, they got quiet and told them they had to leave. Mark started thinking that due to the tension of their arrival, the locals were doing this to scare them off the reservation. They'd then go into the convenience store and they were talking together about how frustrated they were with the situation. The clerk overheard and said, They can't talk about it. It's forbidden. Confused, they asked him, Can't talk about what? The guy continues to tell them about skinwalkers. He says that they are evil demons that were once Native American witches, and if they talk about it, the skinwalkers will come for their souls. They just walked out of there baffled. They thought it was another scare tactic. So that night, when the shaking started again, my uncle decided to be brave and confront them. He went to the trailer door, flung it open, and yelled, Hey! hey, hey, hey. But when he did that, he saw three animals run off. Two were a wolf, one was a bear. As he watched them run towards the trees, all three of them stood up on two legs and walked slowly towards the trees, making a human cackling laugh. <laughs> it scared him so bad that they called their mission president the next morning and asked to be moved. They were relocated that day. For a year, nothing happened. One day, they announced that Carl was being relocated to another city, and Mark was going to get a new companion, Jimmy. They had to drive for an hour to pick up Jimmy from the airport. The road they traveled went through the boundaries of the reservation. They arrived at about 8 p.m. and met Jimmy, and then they go to leave. The mission president tells Jimmy, We're driving through a dangerous area at night, so we can't make any stops. If you need to use the restroom, you need to go now. Jimmy says, I'm fine. The mission president gets serious enough to even freak out Mark. I am not kidding. Go do your business. Jimmy was insistent that he was fine, so they finally hit the road. As they were about 30 minutes into the drive, they were going through the area of the reservation boundaries, and Jimmy starts complaining that he needs to pee badly. The mission president says, We can't stop here. You'll have to hold it. Jimmy keeps going on. I really can't hold it. So the mission president stops the car and says, Okay, but you do your business next to the door. If I say get into the car, you better get into the car fast. With a look of confusion, Jimmy says, All right. Opens the door and starts to do his business. About five seconds later, the mission president says nothing and just yanks Jimmy into the car and floors it. Jimmy and Mark start freaking out. What's going on? The mission president says nothing and just increases his speed. Then Mark sees something next to the car to his right. A giant wolf-looking man was running on two feet next to the car. Mark looked at the speedometer, and they were going 60 miles an hour and still increasing. The wolf creature kept next to the car for 10 minutes until it finally took off into the trees. Shaking, Jimmy gets out of the car when they arrive, they didn't speak through the whole ordeal, and says, What did I just see? The mission president says, Next time I tell you to take care of your business, you take care of your business. One night, years and years ago, I asked my mother if she had any stories dealing with the paranormal or with skinwalkers. She explained that she had, but this story she was about to tell me comes from her cousin, and perhaps is one of the most terrifying encounters I've heard. Her story begins one evening when she was asked by her grandma and mom to watch four of the younger kids while her mom and grandma went to visit a family member. The house they were staying at was her grandma's, which was a traditional hogan. Now the hogan had a rickety door made up of a long piece of floorboard, and held together with baling wire and rope from the hay bales. The evening was quickly approaching. Her mom and grandma explained that they would be back within the hour, and they wouldn't be far, just a half mile down the road. Like most traditional hogans, the floor was made up of dirt, 
and a single stove in the middle that provided the heat and cooking for the household. As night fully approached, she had just put the kids to bed when she was waiting for her mom and grandma to return. She explained that it was getting really late and her mom and grandma hadn't yet returned home, so she made a fire to keep her and the younger kids warm. Then she said the dogs started wildly barking. Ignoring them and thinking that they had just spotted a small animal, she continued to wait. Like all reservation homes, they had no electricity, so light was provided by oil lamps and candles. She said she continued to wait by the oil lamp while the dogs continued to bark wildly. She then thought that she heard her mom and grandma coming, so she opened the door and peeked outside. Still no one was there, but the dogs who were still barking were now facing a nearby hill. Startled, she quickly closed and tied up the door, not wanting to draw any attention to herself. She dimmed the oil lamp and sat quietly next to the sleeping kids. Suddenly, the barking dogs began chasing something around the Hogan. It must have circled around a few times, she said. Then, out of nowhere, she was hit with a strong odor of rotting meat, like an animal that had died out in the sun. Terrified, she said that she couldn't contain her fear, and she began to sob, waking the kids up on the bed. They asked her what was going on, and she told them to just be quiet and sit there. Finally, she saw approaching headlights slowly coming up to the Hogan. Whatever this thing was noticed the headlights too and quickly jumped off the roof. She said after this encounter, all of the kids ran out of the house to their grandma crying. Some years later, she asked her mom what they saw that night. Her mom explained that they had lost track of time, and once they realized what time it was, they said goodnight and headed back home, bringing along with them their uncle who decided to stay with my grandma for the night. As they approached the Hogan, they had noticed someone or something on top of the roof. It was a skinwalker, she explained, that its whole body was covered in white paint, and it wore a coyote skin on top of its head. As they got out of the truck, it jumped off the roof and ran up the hill, and before they knew it, it was gone. She also said their uncle chased after it, picking up an axe and quickly running up the hill to catch it. After the experience, my family sought out a healer, and he explained that it was indeed a skinwalker. He went to explain that it had ill intentions, and the reason it was on top of the roof was that it was going to drop down the stovepipe and kill whoever was in the Hogan. He said that they were all lucky that her mom and grandma were pulling up when they did. If they hadn't, there was no way of knowing if the skinwalker would have gone through with its plan. My dad has had many run-ins with the entities of the dark from his childhood into his adult life. One story he told my little sister and me was when he was in his 30s. My mom and dad didn't have the best relationship when I was growing up, so my dad leaving for a period of time was something not out of the ordinary. During this one period, my dad had left and was staying with my grandma and grandpa. They had a little house close to the mountains, which was about 12 miles, maybe more, outside the city of Gallup, New Mexico. The story starts when my dad and his brother had to hitchhike into town to look for work and to help my brother sell his jewelry that he made. After a long day in town, they decided to head home since no one at the time had a home phone and their only form of transportation was walking. It had been early in the evening when they finally arrived at the dirt road that led home. The sun was setting fast, so my dad and his brother picked up their pace, not wanting to walk home in the dark. As they were getting close to home, his brother began to walk faster. Wondering why, he asked him, Hey, what's going on? His brother looked at him with a stern look and answered, Just keep up. Quickening their pace, my dad began to hear voices coming from the trees. Not wanting to look in the direction where they were coming from, they ignored the voices for as long as they could. Nearing home, my dad stopped and began to curse at whatever was stalking them. But then, it was quiet. My dad stood there below the hill close to home with the unnerving quietness, 
he said that he could hear his heart pounding in his ears. Looking in the direction where he last heard the voice, he said, it whispered his name. After that, he and his brother bolted the last few yards home. As they ran, my dad could hear the mysterious creature behind them. With the sound of bare feet pounding on the ground and getting closer, they began sprinting even harder, finally making it to the front door of the house. Before bursting through the front door, they stopped and looked back, expecting to see something or someone behind them, but they saw nothing. So out of breath and adrenaline pumping, they looked at each other in confusion, wondering what the hell was going on. The house they were living in was a two-room house which didn't have a lot of room for him and his two other brothers, so they had built a one-room shed next door which they turned into a bedroom. They quickly made their way to the one-room shed and locked the door. Exhausted from the day and being chased by whatever this thing was, they went to bed. Later that night, my dad woke up for no reason. When he tried to go back to sleep, he suddenly began to hear footsteps outside the shed right where his bed was. Sitting up, he listened as the footsteps went around the shed. Then something more terrifying happened. The strange being began making a dry heaving sound like it was hacking up something. He whispered his brother's name after a few minutes and his brother whispered back and told him to ignore it and not pay attention to it and it would go away. As he laid back down, trying so much to ignore it, it would circle around the shed, whispering him and his brother's name. Finally, after what felt like so many hours, it stopped. Bravely, my dad sat back up and strained his ears to hear if the mysterious creature had finally left. Taking one more look around the room, my dad noticed something from the corner of his eye. He saw a black shape staring through the window. It looked like a sheep's head, but the creature had hands, human hands, pressed up against the window. My dad shouted in Navajo, telling the creature it's not wanted here and to go away. The terrifying creature then stepped back and disappeared from his view. Sometime later, he had finally fallen asleep and then awoke the next morning and told his mom and dad what happened. Recounting the experience to my grandma, they knew they had encountered a skinwalker. She told him to pray and bless himself with the smoke from the stove. This would be one of the stories my dad would tell us as a warning, never to be out after dark, or you would more than likely encounter a skinwalker. <laughs>